folks, this is Tom Crawford with Technonine, and thank you for uh, tuning in to this last in our Optical Brightener uh, series of tutorials. And this one, to some extent, is a catch-all of a, a number of different topics, but most of it's going to focus on, on color and color measurement, uh, because we've talked mostly in this series about the impact of an optical brightener on the brightness measurement. And to some extent, we've mentioned whiteness, but we really haven't spent a lot of time on that because the two kind of go hand in hand with brightness being the primary measurement. You also need to keep in mind that optical brighteners don't work in isolation, that yes, they do have a, a significant impact on brightness and whiteness, but they also have an impact on the color of, of your sheet. And so uh, while our focus has been on those two topics, we also need to consider the impact the optical brightener has on things like LAB, or L star, A star, B star. So in this video series, I'm gonna make an assumption that you understand what L, A, and B are, or L star, A star, B star. If you don't have that down, then you'll probably wanna watch our color video uh, series before we go any further, before you go any further with, with this video. But just as a, as a quick overview, uh, when you think of color, whether it's L, A, B, or L star, A star, B star, it's based on three parameters, okay? With L or L star being a lightness darkness axis. So L of 100 is up here at white, and L of zero is down here at the perfect black, okay? And then you have the AB axis, and they're set up on complementary colors from one another. So the A axis, if something falls on the positive side of, of A, it's, it's considered to be on the red side. If it's on the negative A side, it's green. Same for uh, the B axis, and that the yellow and blue are complementary or opposites of one another. So if something go out the out the positive B axis that's trending yellow, if something comes back the negative B axis, that means it's trending blue. So we can quantify colors based upon their L, A, and B values just like we use brightness and whiteness with that. Okay, so that's kind of what we're using as a, as a general assumption there. So I'm gonna do some things on the board over here to talk us through a little bit further about what all's going on here, then we'll talk specifically about how that impacts color. Okay, so we're gonna draw up our favorite chart here. All right, so we've got 400 nanometers out to 700 nanometers, and we're talking about this UV energy that sits below 400 nanometers, right? And so, if I've got a, a typical sheet of bleached pulp and I've made a, a, a paper out of it or a hand sheet out of it, it would have a curve that looks something like that. So it would fall off a little bit over here in the, in the blue region of the spectrum, but as you recall, through the bleaching cycle, it's just kind of moving up that scale, but typically, typically it's gonna always tail off over here in the blue region of the spectrum. So I come in with my optical brightener. What does my optical brightener do? It absorbs energy over here in the blue region, of the, excuse me, in the UV region of the spectrum and re-emits it over here in the blue, and we get this energy differential here which increases our brightness with that, right? And so with, with that particular thing, we're gonna get uh, a sample that is brighter. But also, when we do that, the sample also changes color, right? Because it's going from a, a creamy or a neutral white to a, to a blue white now. So we have to understand how this impacts the color space. And so when you're working with whites and near white papers, and you're putting optical brighteners in there, the optical brightener always sends the sample brighter or whiter. The L or L star value, you'll see maybe move a little bit, less than a point, but then you'll primarily see it move out the blue axis, right? Because it's driving the sample blue, so you would envision that the negative B value would increase, okay? So it might go from a negative one to a negative three or a negative five, depending upon how much OBA you're adding to that. So typically, you will see a sample go bluer and slightly redder. Bluer and, and a, with a slight tint of red to it means it's kind of going violet, if you will. So it's getting that nice glow to it. So you'll typically see, see the L, A, and B values, or L star, A star, B star, depending on which system you're using, you'll see it go lighter, redder, bluer. And that's the trend you're gonna see with that, okay? So you're seeing that go bluer and that's a good thing and you know that it's gonna just be a little bit of movement in red and a little bit of movement in, uh, in L and you're typically perfectly fine with that. 
But the other thing that, that can and does happen a lot is that we'll also use blue dyes in our uh, processes to, again, tint the paper. Now, dyes, by definition, absorb light. Dyes are going to take light out of the equation. So depending upon the color of dye that I use, I'm going to change that spectral energy across uh, from 400 to 700 nanometers. As we talked about over here, because we're measuring brightness and the whiteness calculations reward blue whites, the most detrimental thing to a bright sheet or a white sheet is yellow. Yellow is the absence of blue. And so things that drive the sample yellow are going to kill brightness and whiteness, okay? So <clears throat> I'm going to stick with a blue dye to try to improve the optical appearance of the sheet so I as a consumer are gonna like it better. So I add a blue dye in, it's going to lower energy across the board, but least amount is going to happen here in the blue region, and then you'll see it tail off a little bit over here in the green, red and green regions of the spectrum. I'm going to lose some brightness when that happens because I'm absorbing, but I can always make that up potentially with my optical brightener in doing that. The problem comes in is that both the blue dye and the optical brightener are affecting this B value, and they're affecting the brightness value. And so they're both driving that B value more negative, but one does it while it increases brightness, the other does it while it decreases brightness. And so many mills have gotten in trouble chasing two things that are affecting brightness. And so as a control uh, decision, as a control guide, what a lot of mills have done these days, and we've worked with a number of mills to, to kind of move them in this direction, is that they've separated the control of these two things. And so now what they do is they control the dye addition. And under that, what they'll do is they'll do their color measurement, their LA and B values, under an ex UV excluded light source. So let's say with the Color Touch X, we've driven that uh, 420 cutoff filter all the way in, so there's no UV energy getting into the sphere. And by doing that, they're, they're looking at the, the color additions or dye additions based on UV excluded without any impact of the optical brightener, and that allows them to separate the impact of that dye addition. And then they control their optical brightener. They control this with brightness, UV included. UV in, and this is UV X. And now they've separated those two, and so they're not chasing each other. Now they've got been able to separate that. So if you're doing optical brighteners, and if you're doing blue dyes, and if you're doing white papers, which you probably are if you're doing those two things, you need to give a lot of thought to your process control. And that can get fairly complicated with how you do these types of things. So if this is an area that you're looking into as a company, and you're looking for somebody to come alongside and, and to walk with you through that process, that's the kind of stuff we like to do. So, so please don't hesitate to give us a shout because we can help you work through that scenario. So that's a very important thing to do when you're talking about managing your optical brighteners, managing your, uh, your processes and your, your dye additions to that. Okay, the other thing that goes on when you're in this cycle here, and we see this a lot because they'll be, they'll be adding the blue dye and that's bringing the brightness down. So they see brightness go down and all of a sudden they're going to add more OBA to that. Well, remember in that first video, we talked about this concept of overdosing an OBA. And at some point, as you, if you overdose an OBA, that, that minimal law of diminishing returns kicks in and, and you're, you add and your, your benefit becomes less as you do that. And at some point, it begins to precipitate out, basically. The, those OBAs agglomerate together. And when they do that, they drive the sheet green in that fact. And you will actually visually see a sheet go green because of the over dosing of that. So again, this control technique also helps you by separating those two things so you're not, again, chasing uh, a false number there in your, in your processes. So you have to be aware of that as well. Now, the other piece I wanted to hit on in this video as we wrap this up is the impact of uh, fillers or coatings. Now, you'll add OBAs. It could be in the wet end or it could be at a size press. It, so it could be anywhere in the process. And depending upon the type of OBA you're using, it may have a, a better affinity, have a, have a better uh, usage at, at a dry end or a, a size press or something like that. 
whereas other OBAs work better back in the process. They, they go in back at a tank or a fan pump or wherever it might be. They go in somewhere back in, in the wet end, and then they work their way through the process. So, so depending upon where you're making that addition, it can impact the, the fillers uh, or the coatings that you use. So that TiO2 is going to be a strong absorber of ultraviolet energy. And if it's absorbing the ultraviolet energy, that means there's no UV energy for the optical brightener to react with to create the fluorescing effect that we're looking to achieve here. So if you've got those two, you're working together, you can do it, but the, the TiO2 has to be in that base stock and that, um, that optical brightener almost has to go on at the size press for sure at that point to, to make sure you get the benefit of both of those things. Kaolin, as well, will absorb uh, some, uh, some ultraviolet energy, not near as much as the TiO2. And calcium carbonate actually is, is not too bad at all in the, in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. So you don't have to be as concerned with that. But you need to be conscious of those things as you're formulating uh, your product, that if, if you're using OBAs and if you're using these fillers, how do they interact with one another? All right, so that is a lot of stuff over a period of several videos that we've talked about in relationship to OBAs, in relationship to brightness and to some extent whiteness and now color. Um, and that can be a fairly complicated and fairly um, uh, difficult topic to kind of get your head around. So again, like we've said with each of these videos, uh, this is the kind of stuff that we do. This is the kind of stuff that we enjoy doing. So if there's any, any way that we can offer assistance to you, uh, we very much want to have the opportunity to do that to come in and to help you solve your issues at your mill, to help you maybe come up with a better way of uh, implementing your testing sequences and implementing how you manage and control optical brighteners in your process. If there's a way, if there's a need for us to do it, please let us know, because like we've said, at the end of the day, our goal is to help you make better paper.